So one of the questions we have is then, how do we associate these two lineages? We have Australopithecus robustus in South Africa and Australopithecus boisei in East Africa. There are a lot of questions about actually how they're related to each other. We refer to them as the robust Australopithecines as if they're a single evolutionary lineage, but that's actually not even entirely clear. So one of the questions we have is what do we actually do with these? You may have heard some people reference these not as Australopithecus robustus and Australopithecus boisei, but as Paranthropus robustus and Paranthropus boisei, pairing these two together with a different genus, a different genus altogether than Australopithecus, that being Paranthropus. To understand why this is the case, it's necessary to look back at the potential phylogenetic relationships of these two specimens and the species they represent. So let's start back and let's review a little bit. Recall that the starting point for the Australopithecine lineage we can put at Australopithecus animensis, present around 4 million years ago. A little bit after that we begin seeing the first evidence of Australopithecus afarensis, that species that we associate with Lucy and many other famous fossils from the Afar region. And that is a pretty wide consensus in terms of those two lineages and their connection to each other. After this point, however, it begins to get a little more complicated. If we move a little bit forward in evolutionary time to about two and a half million years ago, we have as many as three lineages found in Africa. In East Africa, we have Australopithecus aethiopicus, or the sp species represented by that enigmatic k and WT17000 specimen, otherwise known as the black skull. We have Australopithecus garhi, also represented by a few specimens from Ethiopia. You'll recall that that's the species associated with potentially the earliest evidence of butchery of animals in the hominid record. And in South Africa, we have a much more extensive fossil record, perhaps going back older than 3 million years ago, associated with Australopithecus africanus. Now, here's where the picture begins to get a little bit confusing in terms of trying to figure out actually how all of these specimens are related to each other. As a starting point, we might think that it's logical to think that Australopithecus garhi and Australopithecus africanus, the two species of gracile Australopithecines, are descended from Australopithecus afarensis, this original stem lineage of Australopithecines. Aethiopicus is more confusing. It's harder to know necessarily where Aethiopicus came from and what exactly it is, but assuming it's an Australopithecine, it presumably came from Australopithecus afarensis. Now also at this time period, we have the question of whether or not, for example, Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus garhi are actually the same thing or different things. Recall that garhi is actually very similar in terms of its preserved morphology with africanus, at least in terms of the dental remains that we have for these specimens. So it's possible that these two represent actually a single lineage, one in southern Africa, one in east Africa. Now moving forward a little bit later, around two million years of time, suddenly we have three different potential lineages popping up. We have Australopithecus sediba, those new specimens from South Africa that are very gracile and very small in terms of the morphology they present. We have Australopithecus robustus going back to perhaps a little over two million years ago in South Africa. And of course, Australopithecus boisei in East Africa. So we have our two classic robust lineages, as well as the new specimen Australopithecus sediba. And again, here, the question of actually how all these specimens are related to each other is complicated. Again, the simplest scenario is probably envisioning that Australopithecus africanus gives rise to Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus robustus. This recognizes that there are strong similarities in much of the morphology between africanus and robustus, and perhaps even some degree of continuity in the appearance of these features over time. It also recognizes that there's a lot of potential similarities between Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus sediba. So these might be divergence between a more robust and a more gracile lineage occurring here in South Africa between two and two and a half million years ago. More complicated is how boisei is related to these specimens. One possibility, again maybe the most simple explanation, would be that boisei is an offshoot of robustus. That robustus appears in South Africa a little over than 2 million years ago, maybe it spreads into East Africa, and begins eventually to evolve into something that's quite different and distinct from robustus. Recall that we do see change in both these lineages over time, and so it's possible that robust robustus and boisei are different species from a common evolutionary pattern, associated with this robust morphology and robust jaws and teeth. Another scenario would be that Boisei and Robustus, the two robust lineages, are both descendant from Australopithecus aethiopicus, this initial robust lineage that we observed. In this case, notice that these are all evolutionarily related to each other, that the aethiopicus boisei robustus group represents a side branch. Under this scenario, we might think of this potentially as representing a different genus, or Paranthropus. For those who make the distinction of calling Robustus and Boisei representatives of Paranthropus instead of Australopithecus, they're making a phylogenetic statement, that they think these two species are sister species, related and divergent from other Australopithecines or Homo. So that's one possible scenario. It's also possible that you could call these specimens 
Boise Eye and Robustus as Paranthropus in the previous scenario in which you see Robustus giving rise to Boise Eye. In this case, however, Atheopicus is excluded from the Paranthropus designation and is instead something altogether different. Both of these are possibilities, but they recognize a distinct difference in similarity between how Boise Eye and Robustus are related to each other and how they're related to the rest of the hominin lineage. In making the distinction at a different genus level and calling them something different at the generic level or paranthropus, it's making also a statement about how we use that term. The genus is itself simply an organization of species that are similar to each other. How we name genera is complicated because there are disagreements as to exactly what genera means or what a genus means. The distinction of paranthropus is a recognition that, or a use of the term genus to mean basically an ecological shift. Things of the same genus are basically representative of similar kinds of ecological organisms. The shift in masticatory apparatus in these robust lineages appears to show parallel or convergent patterns, whether or not these two are sister species, one descendant giving rise to the other, or not. Calling them paranthropus recognizes that that's a different ecological adaptation, a fundamentally different niche than what we're seeing in the Australopithecines that exist at the same time. So in understanding this relationship between all these specimens and how they're named, it's in part an understanding of their phylogenetic relationships and what we think is signified by those phylogenetic differences. By calling them paranthropus, by calling them something different, we're recognizing a shared set of differences between them. By calling them Australopithecus, we're recognizing them as simply part of the broader pattern of variability that we find within Australopithecines, and ultimately recognizing that it's not necessarily the case that Boisei is descendant from Robustus. Finally, of course, the biggest question is which of these lineages gives rise to Homo? That's a question that we'll address much more next week and in the weeks that follow in terms of where does Homo come from? Does it come from Sediba, this grass isle specimen that's a descendant from Africanus possibly? Does it come from Robustus, a lineage that does show increasing brain size, that does show increasing facial flattening, that does show many of the features that we actually associate with Homo? Or does it come from an earlier form of Australopithecine like Africanus or Garhi that shows again maybe the beginning step of this massive divergence of hominins that occurs around two to two and a half million years ago? These are questions we'll address in subsequent weeks in this class. But for now, it's important to think about how we name these robust lineages and how that relates to the phylogenetic scenarios that we associate with them.